John chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 here this morning. Now, beginning here in chapter 12, we come to the last few weeks of Christ's life and ministry here on the earth. Now, this is significant because in these last few chapters, we have so much, so much dialogue, so much instruction that John spends really a third of the gospel on these last few weeks of Christ's life. And it, that is, I believe, significant. Uh, chapter 21 is about a few weeks after the resurrection. So we have about a month of his life in these last few uh, chapters. And so this particular story that we begin with here this morning is about the anointing of Jesus by Mary and in the city of Bethany. Now this particular story is also found in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. Uh, it, those two particular uh, explanations of the same anointing give you a few extra little bits, little tidbits of information that I'm going to refer to and so I would encourage you to read those at a later time. But they are very instructive as to what actually took place. So let's just read this story. Verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Interesting. Always Martha serving and Mary at Jesus' feet. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who was to betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? A very pious statement. Verse 6, This he said, this is John's comment now, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So Lazarus and his raising from the dead was a threat to these men. And they wanted to kill him right along with Jesus, because this was the cause of many people believing in Christ. I think that that is probably one of the reasons why that all took place right at the end, right before Christ's own death and resurrection, because it was to be that example to them. He did it with him, he can do it himself with his own life. But let's just, I want you to consider a couple of things here. First, note the contrast of people in this story. I think this, this is very interesting. Mary wanted to give a gift to Jesus to demonstrate and express her love to him. And yet Judas, just the opposite, wanted to steal money from the bag and he was willing to betray Jesus. So you look at these two different people. Now this is something that's very common in the Gospels. Jesus does this constantly in his ministry. And John wanted to make sure that these contrasts were always 
highlighted. And so he, he puts these two completely different people together, a Mary and a Judas. I mean, one who wants to give, the other wants to take. And yet this, these contrasts of, of characters in the Gospels is a constant thing. John earlier had the contrast of Nicodemus, uh, a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night, interested, willing to respond with those that wanted to hate, that hated him and wanted to destroy him. Or you have such, such contrasts as the publican and the sinner. Remember the, the publican was a, a man who was hated and this contrast between himself and a Pharisee praying in the temple. Why, why would he draw this contrast? To make you ask the question of yourself, are you a Pharisee or are you a sinner? Are you a Mary or are you a Judas? Which are you? And then he contrasted the prodigal son and the elder son. Which are you? A prodigal son or a self-righteous elder son. And so there's this constant contrast being made. And that is, I believe, a good thing. It helps you to, to identify who are you. Are you a man or a woman that loves Jesus? Like Mary loves Jesus? Or are you like Judas? Who basically was a phony. Was a liar. And through his lies, basically opened himself up to the liar, Satan himself. You see, when you compromise, when you give place and opportunity to the devil, he's going to take it. This is why Paul said later in his epistle, give no opportunity to the devil. Don't. Because if you do, he will take the opportunity. So don't play with sin, don't play with compromise, because it will come back to bite you every time. And so this is why Jesus warned the disciples in Matthew 26, 41. He said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He knew the conflict, he knew the struggle that was going on inside them. And he was encouraging them to be ready to pray. Now, this, this particular story, I think, needs a little background information. It's, I think, to really grasp what Mary did and why she did it is essential. Because in those days, water was at a premium. And so when you needed water in your house, what did you do? You went to a spring and you drew water and you carried it back to your house. Or you went to a river, you drew water and you carried it back to your house. Now, for any of you that are campers, you know what, what kind of labor that is. When you have to go get your own water, you use water very judiciously. Okay? And that was the experience for these folks in this time. They don't have water, a water company. They don't have water pipes. They can't go and turn the faucet on and get water. No. They have to go do something. It's labor. It's labor intensive. Gallon, a gallon of water is eight pounds. I mean, five gallons of water, 40 pounds to carry. And that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So this is why they used water so judiciously. And they used oil in place many times of bathing. Now, did they bathe in those times? Yes, they did. But in between baths, what they did was they used oil for the purpose of deodorant to cleanse the skin. And also they used it in a very medicinal purpose. In some of the, in fact, today if you if you Google spikenard, you will be amazed at the many uses of this particular oil. It's still being used by people today. Still by being sold today. It's used in, for medicinal purposes. 
uh, and for uh, numerous other reasons. And so it also it was customary when someone came to your house as a guest, you would wash their feet and other time, and at times, you, if you were able to, you would put ointment on their feet. Now, why would you do that? Because if any of you have walked in sandals for a lengthy period of time, you realize that your feet dry and crack. And if you're walking along in dirt all day long, every day, you're going to need some lotion, some oil on those, le- on those feet. Or you're not going to feel like walking anywhere. Because once those feet crack, you're in trouble. And so you can't just get into your car and drive instead. No, we've got to walk. So this is the kind of background that was taking place and I think is essential to understand. Now the spikenard that Mary used was extremely costly. It was imported from, the spikenard came from Nepal, or northern India. That's where it came from. So that means that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were very wealthy. If they're importing this spikenard that is worth 300 denarii. Now, that's what Judas says here in verse verse 5. He said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? A denarii, one denarii, was a day's wage. So, basically, this cost her almost a year's wage. So, what do you make in a year? Would you take what you make in a year and just give it as a gift to Jesus? Would you just pour it out on him? So, this is what she did. Now, why did she do this to Jesus? I think there are Five very good reasons why she did this. The first is the most obvious. She, this was just her wholehearted expression of love to Jesus for what he had done for her and what he had done in raising her brother from the dead. Think about that. I mean, if your brother, your sister was just raised from the dead, somebody in your family, I mean, and... Jesus now comes to your house, I'm telling you, you're going to be falling all over yourself to try and demonstrate your love to him and your thanks, thanksgiving for what he has done. And that's what she's doing here. She is just pouring out a wholehearted just expression of love. This is the way we are told in Scripture to worship him. In Psalm 62, verse 8, it says there, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Is that the way you pray? Is that the way you worship? I hope so. Anything other than that, there's something lacking. There really is. Because you don't see what he's done for you. If it's just, Okay, I gotta sing this song again. I'm you know, there's something wrong, guaranteed. You're missing something. If you pray with, okay, what have I got on the list today to pray for? Or are you praying with all your heart? Are you into it? Are you, is there a fervency there? Or is it just just a duty you're doing? Which is it? She came with that wholehearted love for him. Secondly, I believe she, was, she did this to take a place of a servant. Now what she did by anointing his feet was the place of the servant in the house. Now Mary was anything but the servant. She was a wealthy landowner. She possessed, but she said, No, I'm going to express my love to him and I'm going to express it in such a way that he knows I am a servant. I am his servant. And I will always be his servant. And she came and she anointed not only his feet, but also his head. 
We know that from Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, that she not only anointed his head, but his feet, which was the customary thing to do. We'll see this in another passage that we're going to read in just a moment. And so it's very important to to note this. Now, why didn't John recognize and, and speak about the issue of his anointing of his head? Very simple. Because this, what she did with her hair was even more dramatic. You see, she took not only and anointed his feet, but she used her hair to wipe his feet clean. Think about that. It's really powerful. And so John most likely thought, man, this is the focus. This is what I want to declare. Not that the other was not important, but this was more important. And so, thirdly, I believe that she was declaring here a very simple fact, that true giving will always cost you something. So, the cost of this pound of spikenard was enormous. Enormous. I mean, a, a year's wage. Now that, I believe, is, a, is an incredibly important issue in the way we give. Does it cost us? Is your giving something that costs you? For a poor person, remember Jesus said, the widow's might. Her two mites were very costly. She put in everything she had. For a wealthy person, this was costly. This was costly for her. And so I, I want you to consider, I want you to think about this fact. How is your giving? Does it cost you something? Or is it just nothing to you? One of the best examples of the way we are to give is explained by King David. In 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, there is a story where David is trying to buy the threshing floor of Aruna after he has prayed and humbled himself before God and stayed this great plague that has come against the city of Jerusalem on account of his numbering the people in his pride. And basically he prays and he seeks the Lord and he just asks God's forgiveness and God forgives him and he stops this plague right at the threshing floor of Aruna. Then the prophet Gad comes to David and says, go buy that threshing floor and erect an altar there and offer your burnt offering there. So David goes to Aruna And he says, I'd like to buy this threshing floor. And Aruna says, no, no, master. You're the king. Let me just give it to you. And David says this to him. And then the king said to Aruna, no. But I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with which, which, with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Now this threshing floor became ultimately the site of the temple where numerous offerings, daily offerings were made unto God. And so this specific place, it's the same place where Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac and This was a very special place. And so David said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take this from you. I'm going to purchase it. It should cost me something. And so that is what Mary is declaring here. Fourth, I think that she was declaring here that she was laying her glory down at the feet of Jesus. Why do I say that? In 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen, there it says, if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. It's a glory. So she takes her glory and she lays it down at the feet of Jesus. What an expression of worship, of love, a wholehearted 
surrender. And then fifth, I, uh, another reason why I believe she did this is because she wanted to demonstrate her love to Jesus before he died, not after he died. If you read the account of the women who came to anoint Christ's body after his death, it's interesting that Mary, this Mary, is not among them. Why? Because she's already demonstrated her love while he was alive. Now, I have found many times after a memorial service that I do, people will come to me and they will weep, they will cry, they wish they could have demonstrated love to a person now that they're, they're gone. Mary made it a very clear thing here that she wanted to demonstrate her love while he was still alive. That, I believe, is important. So, I encourage you, don't wait to show your love to somebody until they're dead. Show it now. Because that's really all that counts. She showed it now because this was in her heart. And it was real. And she wanted to demonstrate that love to him. Now her actions here were criticized by Judas. Do you know that this particular statement that Judas makes here in verse 5. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Sounds so pious, doesn't it? I mean, you think to yourself, well, yeah. Well, in the other Gospels, it tells us that some of the other disciples chimed in with him and said, yeah, that's right. Should, shouldn't have, we should have sold this and given it to the poor. And yet, there was another motivation in Judas' heart. Another motivation, completely different. I mean, pious-sounding words can hide another motivation. And you can be deceived by those pious words. So be, be careful. Listen and watch closely. Because John here then writes, after the fact, his commentary, declaring, well, this wasn't because he wanted to care for the poor. He just simply wanted more money to use for himself he, because he was stealing from the money bag. And so be careful. I think that this incredible act of love is, is something that, well, Jesus stood up for her. He spoke up for her. I, I like that. You know, there's sometimes you, you do something and people, they, they say, well, what are you doing that for? And as Judas said, what is this waste? I mean, think about that word. What is this waste? You don't find that in John's gospel, but in, in Matthew and Mark, it's found in both places. What is this waste? What is he saying? He's saying, you know what? This gift is too good for Jesus. It's too good for him. We, we shouldn't give him this because he's, it's too good for him. Is there any gift too good for Jesus? Absolutely not. And yet this gift was really an incredible thing that she, as she demonstrates her love, her desire to express her love to him. Do you want to express your love to him? I, I, I guarantee you he won't look at it as a waste. He won't. He will receive it. He will treasure it. These are the first words that are recorded in the gospel of Judas. Do you know that? The first words in the entire gospel. We're almost to the end of his life. These are the first words of Judas recorded. You know what the last words of Judas are? Matthew 27, verse 4. There it says, he, he declared, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. His last words were to declare the innocency of the one he has just betrayed. Incredible. 
Just a, a little tidbit there. Now Jesus spoke about this, this incredible act of Mary, defending her, telling them, let her alone. And I think that it is in, it very important that you recognize Jesus stood up for her. He's not, he's not saying here that giving to the poor is a bad thing. He's just saying, you're, not gonna, you're gonna always have the poor with you. But me, you're not always going to have. So what does Jesus say? He's saying, there's a priority in your giving. Always. There's a priority in what is more important to give to. And you have to make those decisions. He said, it's a waste. But Mary said, it's not a waste. This is the expression. This is the outward expression of my love to Jesus. And then Jesus responded in Matthew 26, verse 13. He said there, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will always be told as a memorial to her. So that's what we're doing this morning. We're talking about this story as a memorial to her. That is why three of the four Gospels recorded because they knew this was a significant issue and, and truth in the life of Christ and in the life of Mary. And he wanted it always to be remembered. Why? Because it's such an incredible expression of love. And it, it's challenging when you stop and you think, would you do that? Would you give like that? Would you demonstrate <clears throat> your humility, your love, how much you believe he was worth what you were giving? Would you do that? And that is the reason it's, this story is told. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if Jesus wanted this act remembered, how can you get this kind of love? inside of you. If you say this morning, you know what, I don't sense that, that passion, that, that excitement of love for him. I don't, I don't worship like that. I don't pray like that. Well, you know, let me explain to you how you can get that kind of love. And it can be in your heart on a daily basis. I, there are three reasons. Let me give you three of them here. The first is you can only experience this love by first seeing that he loves you. If you're holding resentment, bitterness toward God, if you blame him for things in your life, I guarantee you, you'll never see and experience this kind of love. It'll never happen. I have seen that as an example in so many lives that I've ministered to. It's not going to happen. You have to believe that he loves you. John said, we have known and believed the love that God has toward us. And so when you look at the circumstances in your life and you say, you know what? I've had a hard life. Uh, there's been difficult situations in my life. And you say to yourself, you know what? Where's God? Where has God been? If you've got that attitude, you will never experience this love. Because Mary had some tough experiences in her life. She struggled in her personal life. And yet she struggled through it. So did Judas. But he made a totally different response. And that, I think, is important. In 1 John 4.19, it says this. We love him. Why? Why? Because he first loved us. If you see his love for you, you are going to love him in return. This should be the natural response of the Christian life. I should be in love with him. I should be head over heels in love with him. If I have seen truly what he's done in my life, that should be my natural response. If you're not head over heels in love with him, then I, I question whether you see those, those truths and whether or not you are blaming him 
for something. Now, another very important example of how this love comes to you is when you see what you have been forgiven. This is part of seeing his love for you. Not only what he gives to you, what he does for you, but what he takes from you. You see, he's taken your sins away. And he has blessed you in so many other ways by giving you his righteousness. So both sides of this spectrum are important. In Luke 7, verses 39 through 50, let me read to you this story. Now this story, some think, well, this is the same story as we're reading here in the Gospel of John. But it is not. They are two totally different stories by different women. One, a sinner, most likely a prostitute in the city outside of Nain in, up in the Galilee. And Mary is down in the city of Bethany, just two miles from Jerusalem. So the, the, the geographic locations are completely different. One is in the house of Simon the Pharisee. The other is in the house of Simon the leper. And you, ha- you have to take note, make good observation as you're reading these stories. They're two totally different stories. So let me read this to you. As Jesus comes into Simon the Pharisee's house, he sits down and a woman comes in with fragrant oil and she anoints his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair. Same same situation. And then anoints them with fragrant oil. And it says then, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to, to himself. So he's thinking this in his mind, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this was who is touching him. And she is a for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There were there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them would love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, So he's looking at the woman, but he's speaking to Simon. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet while since the time I came in. And... You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith hath saved you. Go in peace. And so Jesus makes it very clear that this woman is expressing her love to him because she has been forgiven much. She sees this. She knows it. So when you speak to someone and they say, Well, I'm really a good person you say to yourself, you just kind of shake your head and you think to yourself, that's the way I used to think. I used to think I was a good person until I looked at myself honestly in reality and I realized that I am a great sinner. And God has been greatly gracious to forgive me of my sin. When you see what he has forgiven you for, Oh, I guarantee you, you will fall in love with him. If that hasn't happened, 
Just ask God to open your eyes to what you have done and ask His forgiveness, and that will change. Now, secondly, I believe you can get this kind of love into your own heart, but it requires you to reject the love of this world. In 1 John 2.15, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So notice, Jesus said, these two loves cannot coexist. You cannot love the Lord and love the world at the same time. It can't happen. In fact, the more you love the world, the less you will love Him. The more you love Him, the less you will love the world. It's an equation you can't get around. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, verse 24. He said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. So notice here, Jesus is making it clear. He says, you can't, you can't do both. John makes it clear. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. It can't be in you. But what is it to love the world? Notice he defines it in 1 John 2.16. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that is where the world lives. In the lust of the flesh, in the lust of the eyes, and in the pride of life, or the pride of their position. So, these things are very important. If you want that love for Him, like Mary had, then... You've got to reject loving the world. Third and last, you if you want this kind of love, you've got to come to the realization that He is worthy of everything you have, all that you have. You see, Jesus made a very simple comparison. He said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If he had the whole world, would it profit him? If he lost his own soul. I mean, when you come to that equation, when you use that equation, you say to yourself, well, if I had everything and lost my own soul, it would be worthless. You see, that would be a waste. That's the real waste. The real worth is gaining my own soul, is being forgiven. And, and so... Jesus says, basically, I'm worth everything. I'm worth, if you had everything in this world, I'm worth that. And yet, he doesn't ask us for everything we have in this world. All he asks us for is to give him our hearts. That's it. So, think about it. Is he worth everything that you have? I believe he is. This is why he said in Matthew 22, verse 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with how much of your heart? All of your heart. How much of your soul? All of your soul. How much of your mind? All of your mind. You see, that's what he's after. He's, he's waiting for you to come to that conclusion. He is worth it all. And he wants it all. And he wants you to give it all. There's no gift too great. There's no service too small. You see, this is what I think you should take away from this particular study this morning. Is Jesus said to Mary in his defense of her in Mark 14, 8. He said, she has done what she could. You see, if she did what she could, what can you do for Him? How does the Lord want you to serve Him? See, love is always equated with service. Serving God, serving others. In Galatians 5.13, there Paul said, through love, serve one another. It's, these are always equated together. 
So where and how does God want you to serve Him? How does He want you to serve others? Because that's really what we're called to be. Whoever's first should be servant of all. Last of all. And so this is what I believe this story really demonstrates. It's, it's the ultimate sacrifice of love, that expression of love that ends in service at his feet, recognizing that my glory needs to be placed at his feet because he really deserves all the glory. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have, Lord, opened our eyes this morning to your incredible worth. Lord, you are worthy above all. You are worthy of all that we have, all that we could ever give. And so, Father, we, we, just, we give to you what you want. You want us to love you with all our heart. And Lord, I pray for any of us here that are, that are just stagnant or dry or empty. Lord, that you would just bring that awakening in each soul here today. Lord, that you would just bring that revelation of your incredible goodness, your love, your forgiveness. Lord, what you've taken from us and what you've given in, in return. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. We bow our hearts. We, we bow our heads to your feet. And Lord, we acknowledge you are the one who deserves glory and honor and praise. And Lord, we will be rejoicing throughout eternity that we will be able to do that every day, every hour of every day. Lord, that will be our natural habitat, our natural life in this and eternal life. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise this morning. We ask your, your blessing upon each of our lives, Lord, to bring us to that place of surrender, of offering all that we are. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, You've never surrendered to him. You never bowed your heart to him. I want to give you that opportunity right where you sit this morning. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. Will you respond to him? Will you yield? Will you acknowledge your sin and ask his forgiveness? That's what you have to do. And then invite him to come in and receive him by faith. If you want to do that, pray with me right now. Just acknowledge to him, Lord, I am a sinner. Say that to him in your heart. He hears your heart. He knows every thought in your mind. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I want to follow you. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit right now and change my life. I want to follow you. If you just prayed that prayer with me, will you just acknowledge right now by just lifting your hand or a simple acknowledgement, yes, I prayed with you here today, Steve. Anyone here today would like to pray for you? God bless you. Anyone else here this morning? Lord, we pray that you would just touch this life, touch this heart. You are God in heaven. You are the one who forgives sins. And Lord, we thank you that if we ask, it shall be given. Thank you, Lord. Bless, Lord, this heart. Transform and change. We believe you to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.